Today, it is my great pleasure and my honor to introduce to you today's invited faculty lecturer, Professor of History, Robert S. Babcock. Dr. Babcock received his BA in Classics from Beloit, uh, Beloit College in uh, Wisconsin and his master's degree from the University of Missouri at Columbia. He took his PhD at the University of California at Santa Barbara and that explains the tan. <laughs> I have known Dr. Babcock for 20 years. During that time, he has proven to be a superb teacher, a fine historian, and a wonderful friend. Although I was there with him in Budapest and I too saw the monuments he is about to discuss, I am looking forward with excitement to hearing him talk about them today and about their importance to Hungary and beyond. So I will say no more except to say welcome Rob Babcock. Thank you. This will be a very Hastings College presentation, and not just because it was completed early this morning when I should have been working on something else. <laughs> and students noticed that your professors laughed at that too. Um, as Mr. Netterman told you, I was trained as a British historian, English, Welsh, Irish, a British historian of the medieval period. It's a field that I still research, present in, and occasionally publish in. But Hastings College is not a place where faculty teach only in their specialty and then go home and write their books. I teach and have had to learn the full spectrum of European history during my time here. I've had to go back to graduate school, as it were, to read the, for comps over and over again as I develop competencies in new periods and new countries. I am, I think, the better historian for it. Hastings College is also a place that prides itself on faculty-student interaction. We get to know our students well enough to listen to them, to learn what they're interested in, and when we can, to foster those interests. In the last five years, I've been privileged to have a number of excellent students who developed interest in Eastern Europe, and I did my best to facilitate those interests. I read widely, those never-ending comps again. I worked through beginning Serbian and Romanian, I reactivated my Russian, and I learned to apply the techniques and methodologies I was applying to England and Ireland to the countries of Eastern Europe. It's out of that application and that interaction with students from which this pr presentation has emerged. Student achieve achievement made this presentation possible too, and student achievement is also very much something that Hastings College does. One of those students that was in, became interested in Eastern Europe was Nicole Wells, a 2010 graduate from Seward, Nebraska, who earned a Fulbright to teach English at the Transylvania University in Brasov in 2011. In the spring, Bob Netterman and I visited Nicole, who was working in an area of Romania traditionally dominated by Hungarians. We took advantage of the region's connections to Hungary, took the night train to Budapest, were asked for our papers at the border, um, and that was where I was able to see these two monuments that are the topics of today's presentation. If I do this right, today's presentation is also an interdisciplinary presentation, and that, too, is something that's very Hastings College. It wouldn't be something that I say without at least one Latin word, so the Latin word for the day is disciplina. It's what we get the English discipline from, and in this instance, it means both being beat repeatedly by your professor until you get it right, um, and um, maintaining strict control of your method of inquiry. The liberal arts train students to think broadly and to approach problems from a variety of different perspectives. A historian may ask when uh, something was built. An art historian may ask why something looks that way. A social scientist may ask why people thought about it the way they did. A political scientist may ask what impact that uh, thought had on a political development of a place. But ultimately, as with most human things, uh, the best understanding of an event in the past or an event in the present is when we apply all of those disciplines, ask all of those questions um, about our topic. My topic today is an old city in Europe, although it's not as old it will turn out as we think. To an American visitor, a European city seems old in part because of the art and architecture, 
that line the avenues of the continent cities. Old Europe's streets and squares suffer from an accretion of monuments and statuary, images of long dead figures and commemoration of past events so thick on the ground that we can't help but think there's been a lot of history here, more history than we're used to. Budapest, the capital of Hungary in Central Europe, is no exception. UNESCO has de designated three entire areas of the city as culturally and historically important enough to be World Heritage Sites. One of these is the complex of buildings along the city's versions of the Champs-Élysées, Andrassy Avenue. Beginning in 1872, with the backing of the Prime Minister for which it was named, Hungarian architects designed a tree-lined boulevard of neo-Renaissance townhomes, luxury boutiques, and fine cafes. The boulevard begins near the city center, just past the Hungarian State Opera House, and extends past the city's embassy rows, embassies row to the city's largest public park. If you just follow the numbers, you're pretty much walking along Andrasi Street. The main entrance to that park, at the end of this long avenue, is one of those monuments that makes the city seem so old, so European goes a variety of names. The Millennium Monument is how it began. Today it's Heroes Square. It was renamed Heroes Square in 1929. The center of the monument is a column topped by the Archangel Gabriel, who holds in one hand the double cross that Hungarians believe Pope Sylvester gave Stephen, now Saint Stephen, the first king of Hungary to be a Christian at the turn of the 11th century. In the other hand, the angels holds aloft the crown of King Stephen. There are colonnades on either side of the central column, each topped by two bronze sculptures. Labor and wealth on the left are paralleled by knowledge and glory on the right. War on the inner left is paralleled by peace on the inner right. At the foot of the column are equestrian statues of seven Magyar chiefs who led the Hungarians into the Pannonian Plain the land that is the center of the contemporary Hungarian state. So, to review. There'll be a number of decapitated slides. Those are my fault. Last time I did this, I used actual slides. So I want big points for trying to use technology. <laughs> okay. Archangel Gabriel, the double cross, which Hungarians can say without any irony whatsoever, the crown of King Stephen, Labor and wealth, war and peace, sorry, um, knowledge, and then war, and then peace. And now our Magyars. Seven statues are set among the colonnades on either side of the column, making 14 statues in all. Each statue is a figure revered in Hungarian history, such as St. Saint Stephen, founder of the Christian state on the far right, or Coleman the First, there's the first, uh, the twelfth century king known as the Book Lover, who issued the decree that for the matter of witches, there is no such thing, therefore no trials are to be held. The first such issue, the first such edict um, in all of Europe. And my favorite although his head's slightly cut off, Charles Robert, Charles I, son of the King of Naples. The statue sequence on the right include Matthias Carvinus, for you Underworld fans, Matthias the Just, the 15th century king who, educated in Italian, built a library, patronized scholars, and generally brought the Renaissance to Hungary. Like the other statues, beneath uh, Matthias is a rectangular bas-relief plaque, which Matthew has shown highlighting his contribution, building his library to Hungarian history. The last statue on the right, and unfortunately another that I've beheaded, is that of Lajos Kossuth, the lawyer who is both the figurehead and the emotional leader of the 1848 nationalist revolution against the ruling Habsburgs. In the plaque beneath the statue, Kossuth rallies the Magyar peasants rallies the folk, uh, rallies all Hungarians 
to re rebel against the German and form their own state. There's a lot going on here. Clearly, the monument is a testament to Hungarianness, though, as we shall see, it, it is an evolving understanding of what it means to be a Hungarian. In the 1880s, when planning for the monument began, the country was entering a new phase of identity and confidence. In 1867, Hungarians had forced the Compromise, capital C always, with their Austrian overlord, the Habsburg Holy Roman Emperor. From 1867 onward, the empire would be a dual monarchy, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Its ruler, Franz Joseph, would simultaneously be Emperor of Austria and King of Hungary. Its twin capitals would be Vienna and Budapest. Hungarians would be an independent people, responsible for governing themselves from a parliament in their own capital, equal partners in Europe's largest state. Lajos Kossuth's dream had finally, apparently, been realized. But it needed to be realized in a city that had not been a capital before. Indeed, it had to be realized in a community that had not been a city before, or at least a single city, but instead had been three distinct cities, Buda, Pest, and Obuda. Prior to 1848, the Hungarian Diet, or Parliament, had met mostly in Pressburg, modern Bratislava in Slovakia. Like so many of the towns and cities of Eastern Europe, the three towns, Buda, Pest, and Obuda, were inhabited largely by the descendant of German colonists, medieval merchants lured there by Slavic or Magyar kings. Estimates are that only 35% of the population of the three towns, some 17,000 of perhaps 50,000 people, spoke Hungarian at mid-century. Migration from the Magyar countryside in the, century, in the 19th century changed the cultural balance so that by 1910, almost 86% of the population of the new city listed Hungarian as its first language. It's that changing cultural population that contributed to the anti-German Hungarian Nationalist Revolution of 1848 and to the nationalism that forced the Compromise of 1867. This confident Hungarian nationalism manifested itself in any number of ways. Buda, Pest, and Obuda formally merged in 1873, and any number of building plans were floated to give the new city the look of a proper European capital. The Andrasi Avenue project, remember, dates from this period. So too does Heroes Square. Equal partners in empire, the Hungarians could now celebrate their linguistic and cultural achievements in ways that had been banned after 1848. One celebration was to commemorate the thousandth anniversary of the arrival of the Magyars to modern day Hungary. The Magyars, after all, Hungarian for Hungarian, were migrants from the Ural Mountain region, fleeing the collapse of the Kagan Khanate, taking advantage of the collapse of the Carolingian Empire. But in 1882, the Hungarian parliament, now independent from Vienna for the first time, directed the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, now independent from the Austrian Academy of Sciences for the first time, to study the sources and determine the exact year that the Magyars had entered the Carpathian Basin, with the plan to build a monument to celebrate the thousandth anniversary of that conquest. Not surprisingly, the academics at the Academy of Sciences refused to be pinned down to a single answer and reported that there was no evidence of Magyar settlement in Pannonia before 888 and that the con conquest was complete by 900. Given the problems of planning so many building projects, engineers and architects reported to the parliament that the monuments and memorials could not be completed until 1886. You'll be amazed, I'm sure, that the government decided that the exact date of the conquest of the Carpathian Basins was 886, and that it's the millennial celebration, therefore, would take place in 1886. 
The center of these celebrations was to be the city park, the largest park in the city. The organizers erected more than 200 pavilions of a national exhibition, pavilions where, in imitation of a World's Fair, Hungary's agricultural, industrial, and commercial prowess was put on display. A village was built, Stir Museum-like, where authentic Hungarian peasants came to live and demonstrate their authentically Hungarian lifestyle. The introduction to the commemorative volume of the National Exhibition reveals the heightened feeling of that year. It's not behind me, but saying it gives you a kind of an interesting shiver too. One thousand years have passed since the noble and gallant Hungarians left their ancient home in the Far East and led by Arpad the founder crossed the forest clad border hills of this sunny land. And now millions of hearts are throbbing in the expectation of this eventful anniversary. The exhibition organizers commissioned three cycloramas for the event. The largest and most popular, yeah, it sort of shows up. The largest and most popular of these was Arpad Fejti's The Arrival of the Magyars. This is a piece of it. It is 400 feet by 50 feet. It could only be displayed in a circular building, so you went in and you were surrounded by the primal Magyars working their way into the land that now calls, is now Hungary. Such a heightened, maybe even hyper-nationalized reading of history had and will continue to have complications. The emphasis of the arrival of the Magyars could only serve to remind people that the Hungarians had not always been in Hungary. The literal translation um, of the Hungarian, and those of you who speak Hungarian, I apologize, I've been practicing all night. Um, Han Voglilas, land taking, also means the occupation of the homeland, which if you stop and think for a minute, sounds like a bit of a contradiction in terms. And it speaks to the complicated nature of the story of Central Europe. The exhibition was less complicated when it came to other peoples. Romanians were, quote, a steadily advancing culture under the brotherly protection of the Hungarians. A gypsy camp was in the Stir Museum version of uh, um, Hungarian life, accompanied by the caption, this is one of the bleak, but at the same time romantic moments of nomadic life. Feshti's painting will, give clear, uh, will clearly demonstrate the influence, um, its influence rather on the sculpture installation at the, at the Millennial Monument, which was not ultimately completed until 1929. Let's see, right. yeah. That sculpture program, intended to celebrate an authentically Hungarian moment, will reflect some of the complications that Feshti re represents himself. The artist was born in what is now Slovakia, to parents of German descent. He studied art at academies in Munich and Vienna. And while he painted mostly scenes of Hungarian history, his style is in international ones. Academic, that is, taught in the style of the Academy de Beaux-Arts, uh, mixing neoclassicism and romanticism. The Millennium Monument at Heroes Square clearly mixes the neoclassical and the romantic. Though the neoclassical elements are of a size and a triumphalism that might be better called Baroque Revival. Since at least the Renaissance, classical forms like columns and domes and naturalist statuary have become the vocabulary of European culture. And since at least the Enlightenment, these forms have become the vocabulary of the national state. There were ways of saying that our that they were ways of saying that our country is as great as the Romans were, that our country is the next great classical civilization. Perhaps the 1791 Brandenburg Gate gave our Hungarian architects some ideas. Like Feji's academic painting, Baroque revival became the architectural style taught taught at the Ecole de Beaux Arts. Its patterns, classical forms, size mix of masonry and sculpture are evident, for instance, in the 1875 Palais Garnier in Paris, and perhaps even in the Pont Alexandre, begun in that same 1896 
that the Millennial Monument was supposed to be completed in. The sculptural presentation of Arpad and his Magyar chieftains also seemed to speak with the established vocabulary of 19th century Europe. It follows what might be called a Gothic revival, it follows any number of atmospheric attempts to recreate the historical fiction of Sir Walter Scott. Consequently, there is a nobility in the Magyar's primitiveness and a moodiness in their presence. All their horses are not the small Asian horses that the Magyars would have certainly ridden, but befitting Scott, big, impressive stallions. I've devoted probably too much time to trying to place the Millennium Monument at Heroes Square into its chronological context to show how it reflects both the artistic and architectural trends of its time and the nationalist political sentiment of its day. But monuments outlive their time. Some retain their original meaning, some are given a new meaning by a new audience, some lose their meaning altogether. The monument at Hero Square was not complete in 1914 when the First World War began. What was complete was the statue sequence on the right side of the monument, but not with the figures that we see today. The figures there were the Habsburg rulers, and just imagine guys, old guys with mutton chops at this point. Ferdinand I, Charles III, Maria Theresa, her mutton chops were really big, <laughs> Leopold II, and Franz Joseph. The monument then, as it was originally imagined, was as much as its plan was to present Hungarian triumphalism, also seemed intent to legitimize the Compromise of 1867, to place the Hungarians in their rightful place quite literally beside the Habsburgs, who in turn become legitimate within the context of Hungarian national history. By being part of this monument, the Habsburg rulers initially were to be included in that line of legitimate Hungarian patriots. This is not possible by 1918. The Habsburg Empire does not survive the war. Their empire is broken up into new countries, including a vastly reduced Hungarian Republic that does not include Transylvania. A Bolshevik-style revolution takes place in 1919 with a new art artistic agenda, led by Minister of Culture Bela Lugosi, by the way. The entire complex in the making was covered in red cloth. The statues removed, and a statue of Marx, a worker and a peasant, placed in front of the vast red curtain. Miklas Horthy, the admiral who overthrew the Soviet Republic, replaced the statues. But soon after the Second World War, the Habsburg statues were removed again and replaced with the nationalist figures we see today. Although the particular figures are interesting. They're warrior kings. John Hunadi, who besieged Belgrade. Stephen Bokshe and Gabriel Bethlen. They are not only kings of Hungary, but they are princes of Transylvania. And not coincidentally, these princes of Transylvania uh, the territory that the, that the modern state of Hungary lost, that was given to Romania, uh, these princes of Transylvania were all ferociously anti-Habsburg. It is only now, too, that the, the father of Hungarian nationalism and the father of the modern Hungarian state, Lajos Kothos, gains his, gains his pride of place in the Millennial Monument. Continuing right, or southeast from the Kosoth end of the monument, just before one leaves City Park, we encounter a very different monument from a very different era. It is the monument to the 1956 uprising, the product of a juried contest announced by the post-communist government of Hungary. The winning plan was submit, uh, submitted by an architectural group and unveiled on the 23rd of October, 2006, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Rising. The Rising began in 1956 uh, as students and, uh, and workers in Budapest rallied to support Polish, uh, a Polish labor movement that had um, taken to 
the streets against their Soviet masters. 1956 is a transition period in Soviet history. Stalin is out, Khrushchev is in, and taking advantage of this, uh, workers throughout the Eastern Bloc tried to push the concept that the, if we are in fact workers' communities, if this is in fact a workers' paradise, maybe workers should have a chance, to ha have a say in how things go. It didn't work out well. It became very, very quickly an anti-communist, anti-Soviet um, rally in Budapest. Students took the Hungarian flag, the tricolor of red, white, and green, and cut out the hammer and sickle and the Soviet emblems. To this day, beside the monument to those who died in 1956, the flag that flies is the Hungarian flag with the circle cut out of it. There are no realistic statues in this monument. Indeed, one has difficulty determining exactly what one is looking at. It's been dismissed as an uh, a, a iron forest, and a rusting iron forest at that. But as one moves around, one starts to see individual pillars. As you move to the back, the pillars get thinner and thinner on the ground. But as you move towards the front, these pillars get closer and closer together. The pillars start to join together. The pillars get taller by virtue of their being next to one another until the pillars almost form a wall, almost a solid wall. And at the front of the monument, the highest point of the monument, the most solid point of the monument, the point of the monument, the pillars are a solid wall aiming in, the, in the, the same direction, no longer rusty, but shiny and silver. From the sky, you get a sense of what's going on here. It is a pretty remarkable piece. And it was a very controversial piece. It did not have a tremendous amount of support when it was built. People complained that they wanted traditional heroic sculpture depicting people. They wanted the students in the streets. Um, they wanted the students toppling the statue of Stalin, which had originally been at, on this spot. And they also complained that the, the government that was setting this monument up was a socialist government. They complained about the unrecognized irony of a socialist government putting up a monument to uh, students who protested against the communist state. One commentator, um, Stephen Zelotny, wrote, I feel a strong antipathy to it. It struck me as a typical work of provocatively unappealing art that expressed some arbitrary, arbitrary notion of the artist, a notion probably not entirely clear even to the artist himself. It was modern, it was untraditional. There were no statues. As Zelotny has changed his mind and writes in the Hungarian Review a very moving piece about um, how this does speak to him now, just as it spoke to me when I walked through it, how this is individuals slowly coming together on a point where so many died um, for a variety of purposes at first, isolated individuals at first, but then slowly, as the events of 1956 unfolded, more of a common purpose, more strength in numbers, until finally the purpose is clear, the point is made. Obviously, this isn't my picture. This comes from a United Nations website. Um, but from the air, one gets this feeling of what this monument in 1956 is talking to. It's talking back to the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., Maya Lin's 1980, controversial 1982 monument. And it also, like the Heroes Square monument, um, demonstrates a kind of new and universal and architectural style in memorials and monument that are taking monuments that are taking place. Some of you may remember that when Maya Lin won the uh, contest for this memorial, the choice is very controversial. 
It was of unconventional design. It was black. It had no ornamentation. One public official called the wall, the Vietnam Memorial, a black gash of shame. H. Ross Perot and James Webb, who had been early supporters of a Vietnam Memorial, withdrew their support once they saw the design. Former Senator Webb said, I never in my wildest dreams imagined that such a nihilistic slab of stone would exist. James Watt, the Secretary of the Interior under President Ronald Reagan, initially refused to issue a building permit for the memorial due to the public outcry over the design. What opponents of Lynn's design wanted was what we might call today neoclassical or realist sculpture. They wanted the statues of people that they could recognize, just like the Hungarians complaining about the 1956 monument. They wanted statues that looked like what memorials, what memorials were supposed to look like. The compromise that was reached involved commissioning Frederick Hart to produce a bronze figurative sculpture in the heroic tradition. And I apologize that uh, my technology is such that uh, I've, I've cut the heads off the, the, the statues here. But again, the point I hope is made. Um, things we recognize, memorials like they're supposed to look like. Opponents of Lynn's, Maya Lynn's design had hoped to place the sculpture of the three soldiers at the apex of the wall, right next to it. Lynn objected strenuously to this, um, arguing that this would make the soldiers the focal point of the memorial. A compromise was ultimately reached, and the sculptures placed off to one side at the Vietnam Memorial. In the final arrangement, I'm told the statue and the wall appear to interact with each other. I don't know how many of you have visited this, but most people that I see going to the memorial don't even notice the statues. They're looking at the wall. They're looking at the names. And even more importantly, they're seeing themselves in the wall. And I think if I can back up real quickly to the 1956 monument, this is a new trend in memorialism. It's more architectural. Clearly, the, the modernist moment has happened. Things no longer need to be historical. But I think on top of that, the Oklahoma City Monument, the 1956 Monument, the Vietnam War Monument, puts the person visiting the monument in it, like a piece of architecture. I don't think it's an accident, for instance, that the, that the um, people who built this monument were architects. We become part of the thing that the, um, that the monument is memorializing. And while there aren't statues of people who look like us, we look like us. And we, as part of it, in some ways, I think, I feel, um, have a more intimate experience with the memory of whatever happened there than if we're just looking at statues of people we don't know um, living through something that we couldn't understand. The conflict between neoclassical heroism and abstract memorialism, for lack of a better terms, set of terms, uh, is not over by any means. Some of you may have noticed that the government reopened Well, the government only sort of reopened. All sorts of things were funded back again to what they were, but hidden in the language um, beneath the bill in the House that um, opened up the government again was uh, a budget item stripping out an amount for the new Eisenhower Memorial planned in Washington, D.C. This is a model of it. Uh, Los Angeles. Uh, Los Angeles architect Frank Geary, the architect responsible for the Guggenheim, among others, was chosen in 2010 by the U.S. Fine Arts Commission. And his concept was a tree-lined park lined on three sides here um, with woven metal mesh tapestries, which would hung, hang from these large stone pillars. You can sort of see that in, the, in, in this model. 
um, depicting various scenes from Eisenhower's life in uh, Kansas. The only statue of General and President Eisenhower to be at the uh, memorial was Eisenhower's a boy fishing in Kansas, hearkening back to Eisenhower's own statement, own speech that he made when he returned to Kansas, saying, I don't want to remember, be remembered as the Supreme Commander. I want to be remembered as that small boy enjoying himself in a pond in Kansas. The outcry over the selection was instantaneous and ongoing, culminating in uh, Representative Issa's um, pulling the, the funding for it uh, from the bill to reopen the government. The complaint is that there are no statues. It's not heroic enough. It's not monumental enough. It doesn't look like a monument should. An organization called the National Civic Arts Society, run by Justin Shubo, a lawyer and former editor at Commentary Magazine, um, has led the charge against it and has convinced Eisenhower's um, surviving relatives to pull their support from it as well. His complaint, the memorial's only statue of Eisenhower depicts him as a life-size, barefoot young boy, a shrinky, dinky, tyky Ike. <laughs> we have the same debates at Hastings College. As you wander around, um, there's very little abstract art. There's very little monumental art that does not follow the academic traditional, realistic, neoclassical approach to art. What seems to me that's different about the early 21st century from the mid-19th century is that in the 19th century, it was the academics who wanted the traditional historicist art, who wanted libraries to look like um, uh, Renaissance buildings, who wanted universities to look like Greek temples, um, who wanted churches to look like Gothic cathedrals, who wanted uh, uh, museums to look like Baroque palaces to the nation. And it was the public that wanted something more, something different, something more intimate and personal and emotional. Now it seems to me that we flipped. And how we have flipped and how, uh, and the reasons for that would be an interesting study for a different speech, so don't worry. Now it's the academics, it seems to me, who want something new and avant-garde and abstract, who want to build memorials out of different materials than traditional materials, who want to use different shapes and different forms to convey emotions, who are interested in the psychology of memory and memorial, the psychology of grief. And it's the general public, unfortunately voiced by our politicians, but I'll give the general public more credit than that that prefers the familiar and the comfort of the traditional neoclassical, it looks like a person, it looks like the person it's memorializing, it looks like somebody I know, historicism. I suspect that's probably a tension that's always going to happen between trying to remember something as it actually was, whether in fact we can ever get to what actually was or to remember something as we'd like to imagine it. What I like about memorials like the 1956 memorial, and what I like about memorials like the Vietnam memorial, is that by stripping away some kind of imagined past, we don't have Magyars on stallions triumphantly um, riding out of a Walter Scott novel uh, into a homeland that wasn't home until they got there. By stripping away those kind of cinematic distractions, we pretty, are, pretty much are left with ourselves and a contemplation of what it is we're here for, what it is we're supposed to think about. That's going to be different for everyone who comes to some place, but I suspect that it's always different for everyone who comes to a place. We just, without that reassuring common image of the founding father that we all know what he looks like. 
Lincoln with a beard, Roosevelt without a wheelchair. Um, we can fool ourselves into thinking that everyone is seeing the same thing. The 1956 monument, the Vietnam War monument, I suspect if it's ever built the Eisenhower monument, won't allow us that artificial groupthink. We'll have to contemplate the memories, meet the people based on our own understanding and our own emotions. Thank you all very much for your patience. My apologies for technology that didn't work. I hope you learned something. Thank you.